instance at the security conference in 2020. Back then, he expressed his sympathy for Greta Thunberg and the activists of Fridays for Future. And it infuriates me that these kids have to be out in the streets asking adults to be adults. We should be ashamed of ourselves all around the world. As of late, he's been fighting global warming in an official capacity as special presidential envoy for climate. Today is actually the day, as was said uh, half an hour ago by President Biden, the day the United States officially rejoins the Paris Climate Agreement. It's a fitting moment to uh, welcome the new U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, longtime friend of the Munich Security Conference, member even of our Advisory Council, and of course, former Secretary of State. Welcome, John Kerry. Please, John. Wolfgang, thank you very, very much. Thank you for a great introduction. Thank you for, importantly, making sure that climate change is front and center at the Munich Security Conference, which is exactly where it belongs today. Climate change, uh, as we just heard from Jens Stoltenberg, is a security issue. And the fact is, it's among the most complex security issues we've ever faced. What we do or don't do in the coming months and years will make all the difference. But for millions of people, Wolfgang, uh, you know, they don't have to look into a distant future to see the impacts of climate change now. They just have to look out the window. This week in the state of Texas, we've seen unprecedented extreme cold related to climate because the polar vortex penetrates further south because of the weakening of the jet stream related to warming. Last year, the U.S. saw a record 30 named tropical cyclones. Europe is warming even faster than the global average. And the melting Arctic uh, ice has changed geostrategic and military calculations for every country on the planet, from Russia to China and obviously for NATO. And what these extreme weather events translate to on the ground should concern every single one of us. Climate change is, again, as Jen said, it's a threat multiplier. When tensions are already high somewhere and resources are increasingly scarce, the embers of conflict just burn brighter. And when farmers can no longer make a living because the weather is so extreme and unpredictable, they become increasingly desperate. Many, according to some studies, hundreds of millions of people will be forced from their homes, forced from their habitat, from the place they've lived a lifetime. And not only can mass migration drive humanitarian crisis, but as Europe knows only too well, as we saw with Turkey's manipulation of the numbers of people being released and people being pushed out of Syria, if it is not managed well, it can literally begin to undermine countries, homes, peace, and stability. And, and we've seen dramatic change in politics in a lot of places because of this. So when we talk about the impacts of climate change, we're talking about security, energy security, economic security, food security, even physical security. And the question now is, pregnantly, what will the world do about it? Three years ago, scientists warned that if we want to prevent the worst consequences of the climate crisis, we have to limit the planet's warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's the magic number, by consensus among most scientists. The same group of scientists told us that we had, three years ago, about 12 years. So now, three years later, three years wasted, sadly, largely because of our president in the United States, around 2030 is the date at which we have to get the world now on the right path in order to cap the warming at that level of 1.5. So we are absolutely clearly, without question, now inside the decisive decade. It is simply not acceptable, Wolfgang, for countries to think they can go to Glasgow, the meeting we will have, the COP, in November, and simply put big numbers out for projections 30 and 40 years from now or longer. It's what people will do in the next 
10 years that matter. That's what we have to talk about. What are we going to do starting now, going to 2030, for the simple reason that if we do not sufficiently reduce our emissions, and that is true for the United States, as it is true for other major emitting countries like China and India and Russia and Japan and, and so forth, and the EU as a whole, if we don't reduce it, then we simply have not any longer got the possibility of holding the temperature at 1.5 degrees or uh, of, of having net zero by 2050. And unfortunately, today, the day the United States formally re-enters the Paris Agreement, Today, the fact is that only one or two countries are actually meeting what they said they do for Paris. And even if we did everything we said we'd do in Paris, the Earth's temperature will rise to about 3.7 degrees. So we have to raise ambition. That is why President Biden moved to rejoin the Paris Agreement hours after he was sworn in on day one. It is a process that takes 30 days. That means that as of today, we are officially back in again. But in rejoining, we got to be really honest with each other. We have to be humble. And most of all, we have to be ambitious. We have to be honest that as a global community, we're not close to where we need to be. We have to be humble because we know the United States was inexcusably absent for four years. And most of all, we have to be ambitious, all of us, because we have to get the job done. In November, when we convene in Glasgow for the UN Climate Conference, COP26, I believe it is our last best hope to get all of our nations on the right road to keep us at the 1.5 and achieve a net zero by 2050. We all need to develop not just a number, but a roadmap for how we will actually make the dramatic progress we need to make over the next 10 years and what we will specifically do to get to net zero by no later than 2050. And we need to be working, uh, you know, hand to hand with the private and public sector to provide the finance, which will be critical, finance in the trillions, in order so that countries can do what they have to do. We're already hard at work on this. Uh, we will spend the coming weeks and months working very closely with our European allies at the leader summit that President Biden will host in April, at the gatherings like the G7, the G20, at uh, Camelar, at our Oceans Conference, and in the Arctic Council, anywhere and everywhere we can leading in to the United Nations meeting in New York in September, and then Glasgow. Uh, Wolfgang, there, there's simply no faking it at this moment. Failure is really not an option if we expect uh, to pass the earth on in, in, in the shape that it needs to be to future generations. And so we all need to determine what success looks like, how to achieve it, and commit ourselves uh, to get this job above all, to get this job done. Thank you, and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Thank you, Secretary Kerry. I would like now to invite one of our Munich young leaders, Ottilia Mauknanitze from Zimbabwe, to comment. For the Global South and Africa in particular, climate change and the impact it has is quite dire. It has an impact on human security, on development, on stability and food security. And that means responses both at local, national, regional, as well as international level have to be crafted to respond to the particular needs. Whether it's the drying up or the high temperatures in the Lake Chad Basin and the Sahel, or the locusts and the rains in East Africa, or the increasing cyclones and flooding in Southern Africa, these are key challenges that Africa faces, but that are also confronted by other regions in the world. Working together through a multilateral system that seeks to respond to these key challenges is important. To do this beyond the Paris Climate Accord and beyond future-proofing the world, we need to respond to the now and we need to do it urgently. Thank you, Ms. Monganitze. Secretary Kerry, now we have a question from our Munich young leader, Claudia Gammon from Austria. The U.S. administration's climate plans closely resemble those of the European Union's Green Deal. A transatlantic partnership for climate security would therefore only feel natural. 
The European Union uses a trading system for carbon emissions and we're considering additional measures to stop carbon leakage. But what steps could the US and the EU set together to try and build the biggest climate neutral trading area? Thank you, Claudia. Secretary? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Claudia, yes. Claudia, thank you very much for the question. Um, the answer is uh, that, that we tried to do a trading system in the United States a number of years ago, but we had political challenges in getting it done. We do have a trading uh, system in California, Washington, Oregon, and Canada. We have one on the East Coast called REGI in the Northeast. And I think that this will increasingly uh, become a, a key issue between all of us because many people believe that the biggest uh, return we get on our efforts could come from pricing carbon one way or the other. Obviously, creating a market is a way to price it. So I believe this is going to be very much part of our discussions. Uh, we need to come together. Europe and the United States could help by harmonizing some of the regulations and also the finance regulations. Uh, I know many companies are beginning to become much more tuned in to their stakeholder uh, rather than just shareholder responsibilities. And I think there's going to be increasing focus on disclosure by, uh, in, by, by companies with respect to their preparation for the impacts of climate and the way in which that relates to the investing world. And this disclosure is going to become, I think, a very critical driver of good investment moving into alternative renewables, sustainable energy, uh, different new kinds of energy, whether it's hydrogen, different initiatives like battery storage or fusion or fission. I mean, there's so many different possibilities. What Europe and the United States could do together, I think, is help focus much of that energy, many of those efforts, and help to create a harmonizing of the definitions and the rules and regulations that will help govern the allocation of capital going forward. We have a second question for you, Secretary, from Shafat Munir from Bangladesh. Special Envoy John Kerry, thank you for your remarks. This is a question on Bangladesh. Bangladesh is going to be a major victim of sea level rise. The sea level rise projected by the IPCC could potentially result in the displacement of 25 to 30 million people. This will be a major destabilizing factor, not only for our country, but for the wider region with significant security implications. Is the international community taking note of this and preparing for this eventuality? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shafat. Secretary Kerry. Well, I can't. Uh, Shafar, I, I can't speak for everybody in the international community, but I will tell you that uh, I've been, uh, we've been on the job now for a matter of, what, two weeks, three weeks, I guess, something like that. And uh, among my earliest calls was my call with the finance minister and then the foreign minister of Bangladesh. Uh, and we are inviting a number of countries like Bangladesh and others that wouldn't normally come to a major uh, a developed country summit, but we want these stakeholder nations to be present so that everybody will take account in the way that you have asked. Uh, and so in April 22nd, we will have representative, we can't have everybody, we're not going to run a mini Glasgow, but we are going to have a sufficient number of representative uh, regional participants so that the major emitting countries, the 17 major economies of the world and several other big emitting countries, will take note, as you've said, of the plight of people who are the victims of what has been a building now ever since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and I think there are, uh, it's going to be an important conversation. Uh, the island Pacific states, for instance, will be represented. I know my friend, the president of Palau, Tommy Remengensau, has been a powerful advocate for facing up to the reality of what will happen to many of these states. And, and what was possible 20 years ago to talk about adaptation or mitigation now is sort of reduced to a question of where are those folks going to go live and, 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 and how do you replace that? So we have big choices in front of us. That's what the Glasgow summit will be focused on. And I don't want to wind up like we did in Paris, where many of those voices that aren't 
naturally, automatically at that table to begin with, were absent for too long. And so there became a real rush to figure out how do you, how do you uh, uh, adequately get inclusive and bring their thoughts to the table. We're going to begin at the beginning, at least from our point of view, and I think everybody's going to listen very, very carefully because the reality of, of, of places in the world that were 130 degrees Fahrenheit, I think Jens mentioned 50 degrees centigrade, uh, you can't live and work in conditions like that. And that will drive major uh, migration as a consequence. So we're all going to have to think about this. It's not a Bangladesh problem. It's not a South Asia problem. It's a global challenge. And we all bear uh, responsibility for trying to help resolve it. John, thank you so much. I, I, I wish we had a little more time. I was hoping to have time to uh, ask you, among other things, uh, a question about this conflict-ridden issue of Nord Stream 2 uh, and transatlantic uh, energy issues. But um, I think what I need to do is just send you the question over and we'll, con we'll continue this discussion in a, in a different format. We now need to thank you. We wish you much success. Um, uh, we need transatlantic success uh, in this matter. Thank you so much, John. Uh, over to you.